All right, uh, ladies and gentlemen, um, Minister and uh, Professor Melnik, Professor Reichmann, uh, Professor Ganor, um, we are almost done with this conference, but it is now the task of uh, a couple of distinguished colleagues and uh, myself to bring some of the discussions together that we've had over the um, course of the, couple, of the last couple of days. And uh, we will also need the help of uh, some of you in uh, the audience, and we will draw on some of the findings from previous panels. And um, I'd like to start with a, um, a very strange thing that um, maybe we sometimes forget about. So, you, we, uh, we all know what happened in Afghanistan with uh, the Taliban capturing again the institutions of the Afghan state. But if anyone had predicted that this is what we would be facing in Afghanistan, if someone had said that shortly after 9-11, we would probably have declared them a fool. So how is it possible that after there was no lack of military resources to install a different government in Afghanistan, there was no lack of UN resolutions, international support, there was no lack of attention, there was no lack of regional coordination, so, so many things were falling into place after 9-11 and also so much emotional support for the United States who had been the victim of the 9-11 terrorist attacks. How is it possible that now the Taliban are back in power, arguably in an even stronger position than they were before 9-11? That's a very strange thing and extremely relevant when we talk about the issue of terrorism. And because we want to tie a little bit this question together with the debates of this conference, we're going to explore whether there's something we can learn from uh, what happened in Afghanistan and apply some of these lessons to the Middle East and some of the security problems we are facing in this region. And I have the honor to do this with a couple of very distinguished uh, colleagues um, that I will uh, invite to uh, uh, join me now. So uh, let's, uh, let's start with uh, Dr. Dana Wolf, who is an assistant professor uh, here at the Lauda School at Reichmann University and uh, the head of the Law and Security Program. She is also a uh, Harvard-trained negotiation uh, expert who brings a lot of relevant expertise um, to us. Then Anna Boshevskaya, Anna, please, is with the uh, Washington Institute, and she is an expert both on Afghanistan but also on Russian involvement in the Middle East, so she can wonderfully tie together these very complicated uh, regions. And then we have uh, Lior Lotan. I don't see Lior. Well, no, there is Lior. Okay, Lior. Um, has very relevant experience, thank you, Leon, um, because he was working directly with the Prime Minister on uh, hostage uh, negotiations. So he will share a little bit of the nuts and bolts of that. And then uh, finally, uh, Gerhard Konrad, um, former or senior official with the Bundesnachrichtendienst, German intelligence. And um, you will allow me to add the following. Um, if the European Union had a CIA, he would be the, Europe, the former European CIA director. So that's probably the best way to introduce his, his responsibilities on the European level. Okay, now um, before we jump uh, into this, I want to um, clarify a couple of terms that we're using here to sort of clarify a little bit the, the exercise that we are doing. And uh, I draw here already a little bit, so give me like two or three minutes to set the stage here. I draw a little bit on some of the findings from previous panels. And um, I'm not sure if you attended the, uh, the panel on far-right terrorism, for example. And there was an interesting, I think, controversy on the panel that the moderator te teased out, which is, um, so whenever we have a, um, a situation in which people use uh, violence or um, indiscriminate violence against uh, civilians or they use illegitimate violence to accomplish political goals, uh, we, we might be tempted to call them terrorists, right? And in some, in some case, it is maybe a useful label because that allows us to use specific tools to counter that. But we also lose, always, part of what the problem is really about, right? And that controversy was addressed at this panel. So maybe in the American context, if you take the terrorist label and slap it on what happens in the far right corner, maybe it's not always very beneficial. And um, my organ organization is called the Negotiation Task Force, so we work on uh, negotiation problems all across Eurasia, the Euro-Atlantic sphere, and we look at problems from a negotiation perspective. And um, if you take the two terms, negotiations and terrorism, together, uh, well, very obviously, the, the reaction you get from many people is that with terrorists, you should not negotiate or you cannot negotiate. 
And usually people bring up two arguments, and we also heard them a lot at this conference, right? The first one is legitimacy. So if you're a terrorist and I negotiate with you, I give you legitimacy. That's not a good idea. You don't deserve that recognition. The second one has to do with, well, you, the deal is probably not going to work anyway. So, you know, you, you cannot be trusted. You're not able to implement it. So it wouldn't even work. So it's like a waste of time. But there are at least two other dimensions to each negotiation. And you have to ask yourself very carefully if by cutting off negotiations, right, and um, by not willing to concede something to who, the people who you consider terrorists on these first two dimensions, whether you're losing something on two others. And uh, these two others, the first one of them is uh, learning. So we have to acknowledge that very often we don't know enough about the objectives of other people or other groups. So if um, I refuse to negotiate with you, I lose the opportunity to find out through dialogue and direct engagement what some of your interests or intentions actually might be. And as, as Boas always reminds us of, right, an important thing in engaging terrorism is actually to understand what people who use violence to accomplish political goals actually want. And the last one, which has to do with a strand of research that also Dan and I are working on, is to conceive of negotiations, of the ability to negotiate, to understand that as a source of power. And so when you're cutting off direct negotiations, you're depriving yourself of the opportunity to influence someone. And in, very, in a lot of other disciplines, if I'm offered a direct engagement with a person, right, if I ask Asaf, who's sitting here, if I, for, say, for example, let's say I offer Asaf that we play poker, right, and Asaf finds all kinds of excuses to not play with me, right? He says, yeah, you know, you're cheating all the time, you cannot be trusted, I don't like your style, right? So if he's finding all these excuses, or, you know, and then I make negotiations easier for him, well, let's say, let's take the poker example again, I say, let's have low stakes, let's have a neutral meeting space, right? Let's just see how far we can get, no further commitments, no preconditions, and he, he still doesn't want to engage me, but at some point I have to assume that, um, well, maybe, I can, maybe I'm a better poker player, maybe he wants to avoid me, maybe he doesn't trust his own negotiation skills. So once you understand that negotiations is a way to influence people, right, and to also reshape social systems in a way that you want, then you will have a couple of questions before you cut off negotiations. Now, I understand there are lots of people in the room who might disagree with that, and there will probably also be people on this panel who will disagree. And um, before we now um, hear um, a, um, a virtual statement from our Afghan fellow, who will, I will introduce in a moment, I want to briefly ask uh, Dr. Wolf to help us out with one thing that you teased out on your panel. Because to, to narrow um, a little bit the, the focus of what we're doing here, um, when we are talking um, about engaging a specific kind of organization that uses uh, violence to accomplish its objectives, we are not talking about terrorist organizations per se, we're talking about a very specific kind of organization, such as the Taliban in Afghanistan or various organizations in the Middle East. Can you help us out and explain briefly um, how you address this on your panel and how you would define these specific organizations and what makes them so special? Yeah, so uh, uh, good morning, everyone, and uh, thanks for being here. And um, what I want to say uh, that we drew from uh, our panel on Hamas, and it has later on we're going to speak about the similarities between Hamas and Taliban. Um, we were discussing Hamas uh, after Operation Breaking Dawn, and uh, if everybody remembers, then Hamas was perceived after this operation as the responsible adult. Uh, this statement uh, was a kind of an uh, interpretation for Hamas staying uh, away from getting involved uh, between, uh, in, in, in the conflict between Israel and, uh, and the Jihad. Uh, and we wanted to understand what does it mean? I mean, why Hamas is perceived as a uh, responsible uh, adult? Uh, what does it mean? What does it mean? Because it challenges a lot of the uh, conceptions and definitions that we know in international relations and international law, the field that I'm coming from, about uh, actors as state actors, non-state actors, terrorist organization, hybrid terrorist organization. So what is Hamas? And it connects me to the uh, speech of uh, Minister of Defense about uh, negotiating separation from the Palestinians. It also uh, connects me uh, uh, to the uh, 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 future discussion that we're going to have about uh, the Taliban. What is Hamas? Uh, so we know that it is a terrorist organization, therefore no negotiation, right? That's the default, okay? 
But then uh, we also know that it's a hybrid terrorist organization. What does it mean? That it has like an illegitimate activities as terror, of course, but it also has legitimate activities as welfare and politics. And in our research, we uh, took it a little bit further when we have Hamas now as the responsible adult and Taliban in Afghanistan. And what is the difference? The difference is that it's not only involved in legitimate activities of welfare or, and politics, it's what we called hybrid 2.0, another level of hybrid organization. It controls exclusively, unlike Hezbollah in Lebanon that has like an upper sovereign above it, it controls exclusively a piece of territory. In the case of Taliban, it's a larger territory, more people, it's in a larger scale. But in the case of Hamas, it's the same. I mean, Gaza is solely controlled exclusively by Hamas, civilly, in terms of governance. And when we connect to the speech of the uh, Ministry of Defense, so who are we negotiate with? On paper, Hamas is not an official actor. The official actor is the Palestinian Authority, or should have, that should have controlled the Gaza Strip. But in fact, Hamas is the ruler. So in our panel, we want to first wanted to understand who is Hamas. So we had a controversial uh, discussion. So two of the panelists still thought that it's an only terrorist organization. One was willing to uh, actually say that it is a political state-alike actor that we should, Israel should negotiate with it directly. And the fourth panelist, who is a military correspondent for the, one of the Israeli big newspapers, just said, well, it's actually happening when the IDF is communicating directly with Hamas over humanitarian needs, economical arrangement, and so on and so forth. So I think to lay the foundation for the discussion in this panel, what we need to understand is that we have an evolution of terrorist organization, hybrid terrorist organization, we exclusively that exclusively controls territory. Why it is problematic? Because you know that we have like 194 members of the UN, the international community, who has responsibilities for controlling territories. Imagine the world with more and more actors that controls territories with population, that has responsibility for the population, but they are not written in any book they are not part of any international community, and they are not subject to the world order. So what do you do with them? So that's the kind of the foundation for our uh, further discussion. Thank you. Excellent, thank you. Um, may I ask now the uh, wonderful ICT team to briefly put the, um, the Afghanistan diagram on, on the screen here, that I can um, briefly cover the regional context. Okay, so this looks a bit confusing. But here's what this thing is all about. This has to do with some of our negotiation networks research that we're doing at the negotiation task force. And in the context of Afghanistan and Central Asia, a couple of years ago, this is simply mapping out who actually negotiates with whom and how strong are ty direct ties or indirect ties and who is not negotiating with someone, right? And obviously there are a lot of people in Afghanistan who don't like to talk to each other or regional actors who don't talk to each other. But if you map out all the relevant actors, including all the uh, radical groups in Pakistan, in Afghanistan, Afghan politicians, regional players, you notice that somehow everyone is actually talking to everyone because you can always find some tie to go from actor through another actor and then to the person you want to engage. And this is where Gerhard's work, for example, will, will come, on, come in in the context of the Middle East. And that has a couple of uh, important implications. And you will hear uh, Farah Abbas from Afghanistan address this in a moment. So the one is, again, if you are sure you don't want to engage someone directly because you don't want to talk to them, there are a couple of other things you can do in order to maintain influence, right? You can, for example, just like build a very strong network with lots of other players, right? Build lots of alliances to counterbalance maybe what you're lacking here. Or you can ally yourself with exceptionally strong ties with one key actor he in, who in and of himself has a lot of ties, right? Gaining indirect influence by working through others. 
And smart negotiators now how to know how to exploit these regional networks. And you also already see that this is a very important step that negotiation research has made forward over the past couple of years is we often conceive of negotiations as just like a bilateral thing, right? I negotiate with like, um, you know, someone directly, right? And in reality, I'm always embedded in a broader network of simultaneous negotiations, right? Um, take the Iran example that the minister also covered, right? Israel is not directly involved, but of course has there are a lot of things at stake, so you try to influence it indirectly. So now that we heard from Dr. Wolf, uh, what's very distinct about the specific kind of um, hybrid 2.0 organization, and that we um, you know, did like a one minute uh, crash course on uh, negotiation systems in regions, let's hear a statement from uh, Farah Abbas from Afghanistan. And like 30 seconds on her background, she was deputy director of the Afghan National Security Council up until the day that the Afghan government collapsed. So one of the highest ranking women in Afghan politics. And um, she is now a fellow with the negotiation task force. And she will uh, do the following for us. She will look at this Afghanistan conundrum and what happened there, right? The puzzle that I laid out in the beginning. And she will look at it from a negotiation perspective. And she will argue that the final outcome is mostly related to a negotiation failure or a series of negotiation failures. So not a problem of military strategy, uh, not a problem of lack of resources, but it's a negotiation failure. So we're going to hear Farah's uh, five-minute statement, and uh, then I will invite my uh, panelists to react to that, and probably, Gerhard, you can uh, brace yourself and prepare yourself, so I will ask you to react. So can we uh, play the uh, Farah's video now, please? Good morning. It's a pleasure to be with you all virtually this morning. I'm going to talk to you about the failure of negotiations in Afghanistan. The success of a political settlement is contingent on the buy-in from all the parties uh, to the conflict. The Afghanistan conflict involved numerous national and transnational state and non-state actors that needed to come together to make a settlement possible. To implement inclusive talks, it was necessary to balance the conflicting interests and viewpoints of all of the parties involved in the conflict. Although political settlement was, was in the interest of all stakeholders in the long term, it was at best a second priority to narrower individual interests. The US, Taliban, the Afghan government, and the region were the main parties to the negotiation whose conflicting interests hampered, uh, hampered talks and a peaceful settlement. The U.S. started off not interested in negotiating with the Taliban. By the time it became evident that a military solution was not in the cards, space for negotiations had significantly narrowed. The Taliban, sensing the U.S. was getting tired of the war and wanted to get out, marched for an all-out military victory. Yet the Taliban's position was quite different in the early months of the invasion. Ousted from power, they sought talks and inclusion into the new state. Instead, they were targeted. The Taliban regrouped and launched, launched attacks, seeking to now oust the international forces, a goal ironically shared with the US, but on different terms. In Afghanistan, this peace settlement required the buy-in from all stakeholders in the Afghan society. Yet the state was extremely divided and disagreed on many issues, especially concerning peace with the Taliban. The weak and corrupt central government was unable to take an active and assertive role in negotiations. The leadership had its own fears of marginalization from a power-sharing settlement. Pakistan was also a core party to the negotiations. To prevent its encirclement by rivals in India and Afghanistan, Islamabad always advocated its own interest in the talks with the Taliban, while remaining confident that its Afghan proxies were on their way to victory. Pakistan vetoed direct talks that did not include them. A politically weak Afghanistan was deemed by Islamabad as its best insurance. Iran also wanted a weak and friendly regime in Kabul that was not a threat to its security and interests. 
The same was true for Russia. In the end, regional states were eager to see the U.S. out of their neighborhood and use the Afghan conflict to strengthen their relative power position over seeking an end to the Afghan conflict. Both Iran and Russia adopted a hedging strategy and opened direct relations with the Taliban. The lack of unity and a complex network of relationships among the actors made it difficult to align interests. The failure of the past 20 years of negotiation efforts holds insight for the present and the future. Now the Taliban are once again in power. The counterterrorism and socioeconomic conditions in the country have significantly worsened. The killing of the leader of Al-Qaeda in Afghanistan through a U.S. drone strike and the banning of girls' secondary schooling by the Taliban have made negotiations between the group and important international players more difficult. All of this amidst the meltdown of the Afghan economy. Skirmishes along the Afghan borders with neighboring countries, as well as flows of international jihadi fighters into Afghanistan with the Taliban's acquiesce have frustrated the region. Even Pakistan's relations with the Taliban, whom they had historically sponsored, has worsened over the latter's support for the Pakistani Taliban. The West, the Taliban, and the region are once again stuck in a grave equilibrium. Isolating the Taliban to get them to change their behavior is not an option. Although the world, especially the West, retains some leverage in the form of recognition, release of frozen central bank assets, and development aid, they have been unable to effectively utilize them because the Taliban have shown themselves to be an unreliable interlocutor. With the approaching winter and the prospects of a renewed hunger crisis, the stakes are high. Stakeholders must move past their inflexible positions, disrupt the status quo, and seek constructive solutions, or we will witness another failure of negotiations in Afghanistan. And uh, Gerhard, please, your reaction. Oh. So let's try. Yeah, it's, it works. Yeah, thank you. Well, uh, I do agree very much mit, uh, with our dear colleague concerning the, her description of the interests of uh, regional stakeholders and international stakeholders. I've been watching uh, Afghanistan for, I dare to say, 30 years uh, in, my, in my career, inter alia. Uh, and, I mean, there are some not eternal patterns, but uh, persisting patterns, at least. Yeah? So Afghanistan had always been considered uh, as, uh, let's say, a sphere of influence by its own neighbors. And uh, so the nature of Afghanistan with its uh, fractured, uh, let's say, uh, population, it's uh, lots of actors inside the country, and Afghanistan is not the only country of that kind, yeah? uh, is uh, that the neighbors try to pursue their own domestic and security interests at the expense of Afghanistan as a country. They uh, consider those parts who are mostly geopolitically and geographically and uh, ethnically close to themselves as their sphere of interest. It has always been the case. Yeah? Back to the Soviet invasion, prior to the Soviet invasion. So it's, an, uh, it's a paradigm. Uh, and uh, I mean, in that regard, we can say Afghanistan, the fate of Afghanistan has always been a kind of failure to negotiate or failure of negotiations due to the lack of interest, yeah? due to the lack of interest of the stakeholders, the regional and sometimes international stakeholders, to come to terms. Yeah? Why coming to terms on Afghanistan yeah? if I, as a regional stakeholder, a neighbor, yeah, uh, are considering my interest better served yeah, with an exclusive policies, with policies, borderline policies, and cross-border policies with the uh, existing compact minorities and actors. That's all. 
Huh? That's, that's a, uh, it has nothing to do in a narrower sense with a lack of uh, negotiation failure. It's a failure to negotiate or only using negotiation sometimes for keeping up appearances you know, for uh, pursuing your own unilateral interests vis-a-vis -vis, uh, parts of Afghanistan. And Kabul, cynically speaking, was the least interesting point of it. Yeah? Uh, so you have uh, to, uh, and, and the government in Kabul, uh, if you look back, all well, it has nothing to do with the present situation, uh, but it has to do uh, with this specificity that Afghanistan rarely had been governed, also in the time of the king. Yeah? It's uh, not governed, uh, it's ruled, it's a coalition. You need to have a lawyer jirga, but you need to have a functioning lawyer jirga. Yeah? And if this kind of, uh, and the lawyer jirga, of course, is there to accommodate, yeah? to accommodate the various, pretty egoistic, of course, yeah? and ethnocentric or religiously oriented uh, interests of the actors on the ground. Yeah? So it's a very fluid, has always been a very fluid situation, and the king, or let's say the central power, had to uh, maneuver had to maneuver. They, it's not a kind of central power in our understanding. This is one of the reproaches vis-a-vis -vis, uh, the United States and, uh, and, and former times the Soviet Union, uh, Soviet Union. It's always trying to create a dominant central power which can uh, exert its authority on all parts of the country. That, this concept has, until this very day, not worked. And the Taliban, if they happen to be uh, ambitious in this kind as well, they will face very likely the same fate. Uh, you see the Panjir, the events in the Panjir Valley, which is, an, look, this is an everlasting thing. Uh, if I, I if barely, frankly speaking, if I listen to uh, the stories today, I say, yes, we had it 10 years ago, we had it 15 years ago, we had 20 years ago. Yeah? It's always you have the Panjir Valley due to geographical uh, uh, circumstances. It's relatively easy yeah, to confront or to defend, you can't, you can't uh, do anything with Kabul, but you can defend your place. Yeah? And uh, if the, uh, let's see whether the Taliban, really now, Taliban.2, dot, uh, dot yeah, are able and willing, yeah? I don't know both questions, I can't answer these questions, it was, remains to be seen whether they are able and willing now to follow a more, I call it now, cooperative uh, path. If you don't, if you can't beat them, the old sentence, yeah? if you can't beat them, join them. Yeah? Join them in a, a kind of negotiated uh, status quo, an arrangement uh, in order to uh, uh, avoid further conflict between the power centers in the country. But just to quickly push you on one point, which, which then also is relevant as we think about the implications for the Middle East. So it sounds like you're saying that um, the Taliban might be making, maybe, might be making a mistake very similar to the mistake that maybe the first Afghan government after the overthrow of the Taliban, and maybe also the American government made back then. Meaning, thinking that we got this, we are now in charge, we can rule this however we want, but then they de neglect the interests of other parties. So it's yeah. almost like a return of history yeah. in that sense. Yeah, Correct? Uh, yeah. Uh, and uh, normally one should hope and expect after Having, having indulged in that kind of mistakes now for generations, mm -hmm. uh, that uh, nowadays uh, Taliban, uh, who knew how to acquire their power with a mixture of power projection, military power projection, terrorist means as well, mm -hmm. yeah, frightening people, but as well they have considerable negotiation skills, we should not forget, mm -hmm. because lots of advances, uh, Taliban advances, especially during the last uh, six months, 12 months, had been the mixture of... Uh, power projection, terrorizing people, but as well extending a negotiation hand. Yeah? And very many, uh, let's say, uh, victories had been, uh, had been negotiated. Yeah? Uh, provincial capitals had been captured in the end uh, by negotiation. Uh, but negotiation based on local superiority mm -hmm. of military means. I say, listen, we can, we can take over peacefully now, or we, we are going to fight our way, but you will have to pay the price. So you already teased out another thing, which I think is a very important distinction. Just because we, as our government, whoever you represent, just because we decide not to negotiate with someone who we think is a terrorist, doesn't mean that that person or group isn't smart enough to actually negotiate with a lot of people, right? And that's what the Taliban actually did quite effectively. And um, 
you know, they now also um, yeah, benefit from, from having employed the strategy. So, um, one, one last yes, uh, remark on that. If you decide not to negotiate or at least communicate, but uh, not to negotiate with whomsoever, you have to be able to afford it. Yeah? You have to be in power politics or in, in terms of power, you have to be able to afford not to negotiate with an adversary. If you can't, if you are too weak, yeah, you will have at least to negotiate in a way uh, that you come to terms. Thank you. Now, I was about to go to Anna about uh, the regional complexity, but you just opened a window for Lior to briefly uh, jump in here if I can ask you, because we already had a chat about the question of legitimacy and to what extent can actors afford to negotiate or not negotiate. So can you maybe elaborate a little bit on that based on your experience and maybe shed light on some of the aspects that maybe the general public or we often overlook when we consider legitimacy questions and affordability that um, terrorist actors also have when they negotiate, please. Okay, when you, uh, when you look at this um, difficult conflict, hostile parties involved with violence and everything, you need some benchmark, of course, you need an angle. So, so there are terrorist, terrorist in negotiation, there, there is a terrorist maturity, for example, why parties are coming to the table and what are the conditions they need to, to reach an agreement or to fail. So, so the, the maturity theory of Zartman speaking about two aspects, they need to be a, a mutual, let's say, painful status in one hand, and in the other hand, a perception of, of there is a will. Later theory that, that Professor Amir Shifi invests much effort to, to research it is the, let's say, readiness theory of Pruitt that basically said you need in one hand motivation and in the other hand uh, optimism that, that it's going to work. Motivation to solve the conflict based on perception that, that the cost of continuing of the conflict is too high and, uh, and there is no other way. And optimistic that it can work, it can be achievable, the other side will fulfill your interest. When I'm coming to our experience in Israel, I'm cutting it to, to maybe the same angle, but different uh, aspects. So I'm speaking about necessity, have to be there to bring the table into the table, to bring the parties to the table, have to be legitimacy, have to be way to balancing the asymmetric. I will speak about these three. And of course, have to be way to provide, to demonstrate cost of failure, incentive of progress, and the, the, the major role of, of third party as a German authority contribute to our negotiation with Hezbollah and Hamas uh, to repatriate our POW, basically led by Mr. Conrad. So let's speak about necessity. Between 2000 and 2003, Hezbollah negotiated with Israel over the repatriation of three KIA bodies and one abducted civilian, but it was, you know, almost flat line. Some peaks, but almost flat. Summer 2003, Nasrallah raised the flag and said, I'm willing to go to uh, tangible negotiation. Why is that? Because in March, America invade Iraq. Everything changed in the Middle East. All understood that all are now limited in, in any aspects to provide any achievement. So Nasrallah said, if I want to stay a man around the I want to stay a figure in the region, I will use other tactics, not a war, but negotiation. And it took us between summer 2003 and January 2004, again, thanks to the professionality and devotion of the German authority and my friend, Dr. Conrad, um, to cut a deal. Now legitimacy. One of the main demands of Nasrallah was not only release of Lebanese prisoners, this is his ticket, not only the release of Palestinian prisoners, which is reasonable regarding, but also the release of Arab prisoners that held in Israel. Most of them are, are war immigrants. Why is that? Because he wants to shape his formation as the savior of the region as the leader of the region, as the one who can provide liberty, not only to his people, but to other people. Now, whose responsibility it is to provide the need of legitimacy, legitimacy to the other side? I will take you just briefly to one, one event, 2002, Operation Defensive Shield. We are in front of a compound of some security agency of the Palestinian. There is a battle. 
And then we decide, let's go try to negotiate their surrendering. Now, after 24 hours of negotiation, hard negotiation, during a lot of fire and battles, but in the other hand, negotiation through negotiation, we cut a deal. You will extradite 20 prisoners of Hamas that held in this uh, compound, and the rest, all soldiers, policemen, will go, will go home freely. Now, it took four or five hours before, uh, after the the one who negotiated with us, deputy manager of this compound, commander, went inside and nobody went out. We asked him, how come? He told us, listen, since I went inside four hours, you didn't shoot over the building. You didn't fire over the compound. So we have no legitimacy to go out. Our own legitimacy, main legitimacy, if we, were, we are under heavy fire. So it becomes our responsibility to provide the condition to the other side the legitimacy condition that he need to surrender. We operated a coordinated attack, helicopter, tanks, infantry, over the building, just to coordinate the terms that the other side need for himself, for his perception, to do the act that we agreed about. Last comment regarding the balance, the need to balance the asymmetric of this process. Look at Hamas right now, eight years they are holding our two KIA bodies and two civilians. For eight years, nothing go on. Nothing is in progress. Why is that? Because there is a perfect asymmetric that served Hamas with just conducting the negotiation. They gain legitimacy, people coming all over the world and the region to speak with them. They gain certain, let's say, insurance policy for their self-security as Taliban as American and Taliban gain both sides during the process, and they gain uh, freedom to negotiate on other aspects, as uh, Dr. Wolf here said, about civil uh, contribution or civil fare and all of that. So, and Israel didn't get anything from negotiating. We will get only on the bottom line, on the end zone, where we'll get our guys back home. So, to balance this asymmetric, another angle of asymmetric, their prisoners in Israel are well secured under the current local law, international law, international norm. Nothing will happen. They know their fate. They know their position. We don't know anything about our guys in, in Hamas' hand. So there is asymmetric. If one wants to provide an efficient negotiation process, one needs to invest on measure and structuring to balancing the asymmetric. Both sides need to feel and, and understand the cost of failure and feel it. Both sides need to gain the profit of progress. And both, both sides need to understand that it can't be a straight line during eight years because you will lose also from this aspect and not only win. This is the responsibility of, of side who wants to create an efficient negotiation. Excellent, thank you. And uh, just so that um, I understand this one story correctly and also the audience understands it. So if I understood you, correct, if I understood you correctly about the prisoner release, right? Um, it wasn't the prisoners that Nasrallah wanted to see released, wasn't even terrorists, it was essentially undocumented uh, immigrants that is essentially like a, in negotiation terms, a low value concession. As right? far as I uh, remember, right. except some uh, few Jordanian who were involved in terrorism, no, or insurgency, none of the Arab prisoners was involved in terrorism. All of them were criminal, let's say, criminal uh, or humanitarian uh, stories. Excellent, yeah. And so this, uh, I think we now map the, the field very nicely because this, from a negotiation perspective, is like, you know, one of the key principles you want to do when you negotiate, right? You try to find something that's very important for the other side, obviously. Um, but ideally, the costs for you to concede this aren't especially high. So that's, uh, that would be exactly what, what Farah said. Um, that window was missed in the Afghanistan negotiations. So now we, we, from Dr. Wolf, we understood a little bit about the character of these uh, organizations who uh, nowadays also, in some cases, capture uh, states, but then face a legitimacy uh, problem. We heard um, something about uh, regional uh, complexity and um, how some of these uh, local conflicts are also intertwined with external regional players who might interfere, also relevant, very relevant in the context of the Middle East. And then we also heard some of the negotiation tactics you can actually use still in these situations to maybe get what you want. But um, 
this is already complicated enough, taking either the Central Asia, Afghanistan example, nor the Middle East. But then we also have situations in which on top of all of that, we have uh, external great powers who intervene and make everything even more complex. So such as uh, Russia and the Middle East, or such as uh, Russia and the United States and China and Central Asia. So Anna, based on your research, maybe you can uh, shed a little bit of light on uh, the patterns you, you have observed in the context of external great power involvement in these regional conflict zones and how that then impacts negotiations to resolve conflicts. Sure. Th thank you very much. Uh, I think specifically with regard to Russia in Afghanistan, uh, from a geopolitical perspective, uh, the point I'd like to highlight is uh, how much Russia took advantage of the way in which the United States had handled the withdrawal from Afghanistan, which allowed uh, for the Taliban uh, to come in. Uh, you, you, were, you were watching it from uh, comments uh, coming out from uh, very senior uh, Russian analysts or policymakers basically saying uh, when the Soviet Union withdrew from Afghanistan, at least the government held for three years. Uh, look at what Americans have done. The government uh, couldn't hold on even for several days. Uh, so uh, from a geopolitical perspective, uh, 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 the, way, the way you handle these... Uh, uh, these negotiations, also these withdrawals, holds uh, enormous geopolitical uh, implications. Uh, Russia, for its part, had opened a channel of communication to the Taliban perhaps as early as 2007, depending on what, what sources uh, you see, and had invited the Taliban uh, for talks, uh, had tried to position itself as a mediator, uh, and now, officially, at least Russian officials had suggested that the reason why they engaged in these negotiations was because the Taliban was anti-ISIS. Uh, however, uh, if you take the date of 2007, ISIS at that point did not exist. Uh, so this raises questions, uh, as we usually face with Russia, to, as, as far as uh, an honesty of how Russia in particular engages uh, in negotiations. But the fact of the matter is, uh, the Kremlin saw the writing on the wall for several years and was looking to position itself in Afghanistan. Uh, especially having uh, remembered the Soviet ex uh, previous experience and Soviet failures. Um, uh, in, in fact, you could see it in Putin's speech uh, shortly after the withdrawal. You could already see Putin was hilt hinting at, um, uh, at recognizing the Taliban as a legitimate entity. Um, you know, and this issue raises, the situation first raises implications for Afghanistan in particular, but it also raises questions for the Middle East and uh, broader geopolitical implications as well, right? So, so, uh, so first, uh, you see Russia uh, engaging uh, with the Taliban uh, at a time when the Taliban itself did not think uh, that it would be strong enough to take power. They were basically surprised completely. This was, this was completely unexpected. Um, they felt empowered. Uh, so, you, you, so rather than dealing with the Taliban more from a position of strength and looking for ways to uh, moderate their behavior as uh, earlier negotiations had attempted, uh, in, instead we're dealing, uh, Russia is dealing with the Taliban basically as it is and not looking for, for them to modify their behavior. Um, when, it comes to, uh, when it comes to the Middle East, um, for, first it empowers, the, 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 you know, you can even draw implications to Ukraine. When we think about why and how did Russia proceed with its intervention, with its invasion uh, of Ukraine, uh, Afghanistan has been cited as one contributing uh, factor. Uh, perception of America as weak, perception of America not doing anything in the face of another Russian invasion. Uh, so what America does in one place reverberates globally and we're now seeing the worst war in Europe since World War II. Uh, the worst refugee crisis uh, since World War II, essentially. Um, and when it comes to the Middle East, uh, another implication is that, again, first, um, uh, the United States, uh, the signal that, is sent, that, that the sends is that the United States is not interested uh, in being engaged in so-called, quote-unquote, endless wars. It's, I don't like this term. I'd be happy to explain why. Um, but also, uh, when you think about the involvement of external powers in the Middle East, a country such as Syria, another country that is completely, um, at this point, remains reliant on external actors. We talk about Syria as a place, but really it's, a, it, it's basically a, 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 a zone divided into spheres of influence. Uh, ruled by, uh, uh, one of which is ruled by a man who is uh, guilty of war crimes and is looking at this point at normalization by, by the Arab states. 
uh, despite having committed war crimes, uh, and also a man who uh, arguably encouraged uh, the rise of ISIS in the first place, uh, who served as perhaps, whose behavior perhaps served as the largest recruitment uh, for ISIS, uh, which goes to the issue also of international norms and erosion of international norms of behavior. Thank you. So one, one thing that already came out now in your statement and also in Gerhard's statement is how deeply connected um, these conflicts can be both within regional conflict systems but even um, across conflict zones, right? So how the behavior or the, you know, the perception that the government has of one state in one area can you know, influence the cost-benefit calculus that maybe a non-state actor makes in another conflict zone, right? Which is like a very, very important insight and also very relevant in the context of the work that we are doing here. Now, now because we are talking about negotiations in, um, in conflict systems and in these situations of turbulence complexity, um, Dana, do you want to uh, maybe um, start wrapping us up here and um, say a little bit um, about your recent work on... Um, negotiation tactics and strategy that work in these situations where you have to balance all these multiple actors, where you have um, very capable non-state actors who might use terrorist means, but who also might be very capable negotiators. So maybe you can um, explain to the audience to us a little bit about your uh, recent work on these topics. So I'll do it very quickly because I see that the time is over. Um, but what, t to wrap it up, so uh, our research together with uh, Arvid uh, is focusing on the complexity that you see uh, specifically in the Middle East. So uh, we talk about negotiation system and why it is a negotiation system because it's a conflict system. So we don't have only a sole uh, individual, uh, uh, I'm sorry, uh, one, one conflict of Israel and Palestine, for example, uh, the Palestinian Authority, but we have like a conflict system that uh, 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 is around the Middle East. So we are having the uh, Iran deal, and then we have uh, uh, Syria, as you just mentioned, and uh, we have the superpowers who are influencing, and uh, uh, we had the rise of ISIS, and then uh, uh, the, the, the way, you know, uh, countries had to deal with that. Uh, we have security issues that are becoming, becoming prioritized over uh, the actual conflict itself. Uh, and that's why you see uh, accords as the Abram Accords, uh, uh, which are more regional in one hand, but also leverage the security over the conflict itself. And when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, it is a conflict that exists within a negotiation system, meaning that the bilateral negotiation uh, solely cannot be resolved without having, uh, uh, without taking into consideration the other conflicts that are around. In that case, the development of strategies and tactics is uh, more complex, and uh, the the priorities of issues are changing. So, if you had to uh, uh, um, negotiate the conflict itself. Uh, now you are taking into the consideration, uh, first of all, the regional uh, needs uh, as we see them. And also, uh, one more challenge that we see with uh, the Israeli-Palestinian conflicts, and it connected me to the first point that I made about hybrid 2.0, organizations is that in this case, uh, not that uh, negotiation is the source of power as it just opened, uh, since we had so many rounds that have failed, it, it is not a source of power anymore until it would be proven uh, otherwise. And uh, as you mentioned, the digimacy and, uh, and, uh, and in the case of, of, of the Israeli-Palestinian conflict, we are going back that now we have two actors that are representing the Palestinian people. So who are you negotiating with? And it takes me uh, takes again back to the negotiation system. So Hamas is controlling Gaza, and the Palestinian Authority is trying to control uh, uh, Judea and Samaria, the West Bank. But how do you, with whom are you negotiate with? So you have so both. Okay, so what are you negotiating? Are you negotiating only security? Or you are, as we heard from the Minister of Defense, you want to get to a point that you are being separated. Okay, so who is making the decision uh, in case you are negotiating? Is it Hamas or is it the Palestinian Authority? And I think that in that case, the international community uh, has a great role to uh, kind of uh, come into the picture and uh, since Operation Breaking Dawn and even before that, 
the previous operation, um, recognize the situation. Because in the international discourse, uh, the, the conflict itself is being related as one unit of territories, Gaza and the West Bank. Thank okay, you. so I cannot resist. I have to ask a very quick question. Did I understand you're not correctly here? So you are saying that um, you're advocating for maybe even more direct negotiations that Israel should undertake. So maybe making some of um, uh, Gerhard's uh, mediator colleagues uh, taking their jobs away and have direct negotiations. That's that's a side uh, comment, but I think that there is no uh, no constraint from a direct negotiation because the days and the era that we didn't negotiate directly because we were afraid of acknowledging the other side or giving some legitimacy is not relevant anymore. We are dealing with uh, powers that exist in the area, hybrid power. In one hand, they are already control regime. People already negotiate with you about civil affairs. And in the other hand, of course, hybrid, they are doing other tactics. So I think if it serves your interest, if it is well designed, not to prefer one side and neglect the other side, strengthen one side and weaken the other side, well designed as a campaign, as a full campaign, such as military campaign, we can reach our hand, even if it's holding the knife, or even if it's holding the suit of the negotiator to any part in the region, as long as it is served our interest. One last comment for a few seconds regarding Afghanistan. I think, and this is the end phase of the conference, so I can say it freely, because it will be forgotten while you're traveling back home. I will say that, uh, in Afghanistan peace process, the main parties, America and the Taliban, and the main interest of the stakeholders, Russia, China, India, Pakistan, were served. The only party, the only one that didn't achieve anything was the Afghan government and the Afghan country. And why is that? Because they weren't part of the negotiation process from the first time. So it's not, it wasn't a failure of negotiation, it was something else. And the question comes from part that wasn't really part of the negotiation process. That's Be why it didn't gain. Beautiful. Thank you for, for wrapping us up. And uh, let me conclude not just by thanking the wonderful panelists, but because we're wrapping it up, I also want to thank on behalf of all of us, I assume, the wonderful ICT team for putting this all together. And last comment, uh, Boaz, um, of course we heard from many people how impressed they are with all the experts you have invited, but let me add a personal note, I am maybe even more impressed by the fact that you are inspiring another generation uh, of people and that you have a wonderful team of very uh, young people who are very interested in making this world a more peaceful and safer place. So thank you for that. Thank you, Arvid. Coming, coming from you, it's a real compliment and I would like actually to thank the last panel uh, uh, Gerhard and Anna and uh, Dana, of course, you, uh, Arvid, which you are really a mastermind in this field, and uh, my brother from another mother and another father, Lior. Uh, thank you. Thank you very much uh, uh, for uh, sharing your, your uh, thoughts uh, on that important matter.